When Donald Trump declared last week that the U.S. was making a seismic policy shift in the Middle East, officially recognizing Jerusalem as the capital of Israel, the fallout was swift. The bulk of the initial coverage focused on the potential for a violent reaction. That is to be expected. The media like flashpoints. Palestinians on the streets provided them with one. The problem is that that focus does little to explain the real story, the root causes of the anger. And it fits right into a neat little stereotype, widely held outside the region, that the people of the Middle East, Palestinians in particular, have violent tendencies that are just waiting for a news peg to come out. Relatively few Palestinian voices were granted a media platform to get at that context, the conditions of life under an Israeli occupation that has lasted more than half a century. For foreign correspondents looking to make a name for themselves, Jerusalem is a posting that comes with plenty of prestige. However, the journalism produced there, like the city itself, is among the most contested in the world. Our starting point this week, Washington, D.C. Today, we finally acknowledge the obvious, that Jerusalem is Israel's capital. They called it breaking news, but it really wasn't. The White House had given notice. The media knew at least 24 hours before the president's auto cue began rolling that the announcement was coming. When the news crews descended upon Jerusalem's Damascus Gate, a frequent flashpoint, they found more journalists and Israeli security personnel there than Palestinians. Uh, we are just outside the Damascus Gate here in Jerusalem. The crews then moved on to Ramallah, where protesters came out in numbers and conformed to a ready-shaped narrative that Palestinians have heard before. We have Palestinians, uh, they're throwing rocks. You can see some of them have uh, slingshots here. What was focused on was this notion that uh, this uh, could be a bad idea because it was going to instigate all kinds of violence. Violence is broken out within a matter of seconds. It could potentially result in acts of violence against American interests in the region. U.S. embassies across the region are staffing up on security, including U.S. Marine FAST teams. The framing around the question of violent reaction plays very much into stereotypes about Arabs and Muslims that are prevalent here in the United States. These sorts of scenes you often see in this part of the world. We're used to the narrative of angry Arabs. There's talk of a new uprising starting, what Palestinians call an intifada. We're not used to the narrative of the nonviolent displays of pushback, but also perpetuates all kinds of stereotypes in terms of how one sees the violence on one side the Palestinian side, ignoring the, the daily violence inherent in, in, in an occupation. One way is to frame it as the media sort of over-focusing on either the potential or the actuality of Palestinian or Arab violence. I think the other way to think about it is, you know, basically does the international media, the mainstream media, give enough attention kind of between bouts of violence to the complexities of the Palestinian and Israeli situations? And I think that, um, the answer is we try to. In a story that is so fiercely disputed, right down to the way journalists use the word disputed, terminology matters. In the same way that pictures, images tend to drive news stories, words and the way they are used frame them. The situation with covering daily oppression of Palestinians comes from the language that the media has constantly used. Jerusalem is not called an occupied city, it's just called Jerusalem. And clashes are expected here in Jerusalem. I'm here in Jerusalem, a city on edge. Uh, illegal Jewish-only settlements are, are called neighborhoods. Uh, Palestinian protests and demonstrations are called riots. There have been daily riots in and around Jerusalem. Israeli police stormed one of the holiest sites in Jerusalem today after riots broke out. Attacking protests is called dispersing crowds by, by Israel, and the media has adopted this. Our team caught in the tear gas used to disperse the crowds. Israeli troops who used tear gas and rubber bullets to disperse the crowds. When you see these subtleties in the reports and the language being adopted as the norm, it's, it's the same language that Israel uses and unfortunately has dominated the narrative. Let's bring in our panel. Another factor that can shape news coverage, another way to measure it, is the choice of what voices the news media turn to, who they put on the air or quote in print. 
Palestinians and their supporters have long contended that the international news media, and the US media in particular, disproportionately rely on not just Israeli or Jewish voices, but also on international experts and analysts, too many of whom are a long way from the story. The fires, the protesting, uh, burning the American flag, the Israeli flag, it's already begun. Yeah, it has already begun, and we don't know how bad it'll get. U.S. media and international media in general has constantly and incessantly taken um, international voices over that of Palestinians. A, it strips agency of Palestinians, and B, it helps in the denial of the existence of Palestinians. This comes from not giving us a voice. It comes from stripping our fate and putting it in the hands of analysts or experts that are internationals that do not live here, that do not experience the consequences of Israeli oppression. So if the President of the United States uh, makes a decision that impacts the U.S.-Israel relationship, uh, it is overwhelmingly Israelis that are given permission to narrate events. Out front now, the Israeli ambassador to the United States, Ron Dermer. And Ambassador, good to have you back on the show. Along with their American counterparts, who are, as we know, overwhelmingly supportive of Israel. And I'm going to be frank with you. I sometimes benefit from that. I'm another white Jewish man. But this proliferation, especially of white Jewish voices, is losing a good bit of the story. Now, we're not all the same. We're not a monolithic white Jewish voice, but we are cut from a certain kind of cloth. And we're not hearing from others who aren't cut from that cloth. That's the DC inside bubble talk, especially. The other conflict in the coverage of this story lies within the US news media themselves. Several major American news outlets not named Fox have been accused by President Trump of dealing in fake news, and they have not pulled their punches in aggressively covering this White House. Many of those same outlets are frequently forced to defend their coverage of the Palestine-Israel conflict against accusations of a pro-Israel bias. So what do they do when Trump, whose other foreign policy adventures are covered so critically, comes out with a policy that is distinctly pro-Israel? I just don't agree with the premise of the question. I don't think that U.S. news outlets, certainly not the one I work for, are biased uh, toward Israel, nor do I think that we're, uh, you know, progenitally against Trump or, or trying to criticize Trump. They approach it to say, why is Trump doing this? What will the impact be? What does it mean? Why does it matter? Why now? What's next? Those are the questions we ask. We don't ask, like, is this good for Israel? The Trump announcement was actually dealt with quite critically in large sections of the American media, partly because it being Trump trumped it being Israel, so to speak. Across the board, we're hearing from a lot of different forces agreeing this wasn't a good move. There were attempts to read nuance into what President Trump said. How did you read this move? Something which simply weren't there in the text. Uh, the text was anything but nuanced, it was a sledgehammer. But I think the American media did give quite a lot of weight to the very voluble and almost wall-to-wall -wall international as well as expert criticism of the president's move. And at the same time, all of this, this focus on, on Trump, has alleviated Israel from its role, from its colonization of cities like Jerusalem. Despite the policies that it's been enforcing on, on the Palestinian residents of Jerusalem, such as revoking residency, um, home demolitions, um, arbitrary arrests. So this, this uh, imbalance kind of makes you want to question what is really being reported here. And what is not being reported? Images like this one, a boy of 16 who says an Israeli soldier butted him with a rifle. It went viral on Palestinian social media, but for the most part, that's as far as such images go. They tend not to be considered newsworthy by the mainstream media in what has become Donald Trump's America. This image is a, uh, a very accurate representation of the imbalance of power on the ground. The image has kind of uh, become the uh, iconic representation uh, of uh, this moment among Palestinians. A 16-year-old Palestinian boy surrounded 
by heavily armed Israeli soldiers. And yet the images that come across in uh, American media are often images of Palestinians acting out in violence against uh, Israelis. But the reality is that the overwhelming amount of violence that takes place is directed at Palestinians and the absence of the uh, coverage of that reality contributes to the skewed perceptions and opinions held by many Americans today.